Talk. Identity. And access. Management. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff, and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? I'm good. And yourself? Good. I just I just want to warn you and warn everybody who's listening. Today is the today's landscaper day, right? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we might hear the humming of uh, weed whackers and riding mowers in my backyard. Uh, it's just potluck on when they show up and. This week, they decided to show up just as we were recording. So I may be hitting that mute button a a few extra times. (laughs) That sounds like a very, very, very first world problem to me, but I'm sure we'll find a way to manage. Yes, yes. The people who take care of my my yard. (laughs) Yes, it is a very first world problem. I'm very fortunate to to have that problem. Exactly. Um, so we've got a few different things we're going to talk about today. Before we dive into our main topic, I uh, just want to remind folks around um, our special episode that we're doing for Ping Identities Identify 2020 conference that's coming up. It's going to be October 7th and 8th. So uh, for those not aware, we recorded a special video episode that's going to premiere uh, as part of that conference. And uh, you'll be able to catch it then later as part of uh, our normal kind of podcast routine, probably go live at some point after that. Uh, So if you haven't registered for uh, that conference, feel free to do so. Feel free to check us out and, uh, you know, be able to put faces and names and those sorts of things. So um, before and and then for, for today, from a topic perspective, what I'm thinking is that we talk around Um, identity and product management specifically. And to help with that, we've got a special guest where we've asked Mary Ritz, who's the vice president of product management at Ford Rock uh, to join us. And she's coming in all the way from Denver, Colorado. So welcome to the show, Mary. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Great. So we've got a traditional kind of first question for all of the uh, folks that we bring on, and that's to kind of talk about their background and how how they got into IAM and whether it chose you or you chose it. So maybe you can start with kind of letting us know what your answer is to that question. My route to identity was through cybersecurity. Uh, So I started my career at, it was called ethical hacking. It's what you called pen testing at the time. And my career was always around, um, it it evolved in threat and breach mitigation and detection. And so my path to identity sort of followed the hacker's path. But, you know, early in the days when you detect breaches, you could just look at packets, network packets on the wire. And then hackers move up the stack. And so we got good at looking operating system logs and understanding operating systems. And then you move up the stack again to application security to detect breaches. Uh, And then ultimately it got to identity as the perimeter disappears. Maybe you don't have access to network logs or there's no OS logs you have to look at. Now you're starting to look at user behavior. Um, So that's when I really got interested in identity. And then, uh, so yeah, most of my career in cybersecurity uh, in various roles as practitioner or product management, for example, I ran the ArcSight SIM product. And so when I flipped to Fordrock, it was actually my first time fully in the identity domain. And uh, I love it because identity not only has this dimension of cybersecurity that's so critical, but it has an additional element of like digital transformation and user experience. And so it just, I feel like it's doubled the amount of innovation and sort of creative thinking. So if I found anything cooler than cybersecurity, it was the identity domain. So here I am. I think that's a, a great a great background of being a hacker really gives you um, a good foundation, <laughs> ethical hacker. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, but kind of that hacking background gives you, you know, one of the things I think that, um, really helps, you know, from a consulting standpoint is being able to put yourself in the shoes of kind of thinking like the bad guys. Uh, What are the potential routes in the door and what are the motivations for getting out identity data and et cetera, et cetera. Because sometimes, you know, what um, appears to be something of low value could actually be of high value. And, you know, we talk about a lot of the major data breaches that have occurred. And, you know, you know, one example we talked about was the MGM data breach and 
where there's, you know, hypothesis or, or theory that um, state actors were looking for reservation data that could be used to blackmail people. So, you know, wow, that's that's some really interesting thinking. But that goes into kind of, okay, now you can see why this data is so important to have good controls around. Absolutely. It gives you a good, um, my background gives me a good healthy paranoia about, you know, our identities online because I've seen almost every technology hacked. So I have very, very healthy paranoia. Yeah, very healthy paranoia. So um, you've transitioned from that cybersecurity space into identity, and now you're in a very important role at Forge Rock as a, pro- as a product manager. And just kind of, I, I think you might be our first guest who's actively in that role in a, in a major IAM company. So maybe you can give our listeners kind of a background on what does a product manager actually do for an identity company? You know, ultimately the, the product management team is responsible for delivering a great innovative, differentiated product, um, but also unlocking how that product gains commercial traction. But I think, um, you know, practically it's an interesting role because so you're developing a roadmap for the product and all of the backlog of the things that you'll build, but it's, it's a job that requires hyper communication. So you're absorbing a ton of information from customers and analysts about what's, what's needed. And then you're talking to engineers about what's possible to build. And then you've got to talk to sales to make sure they understand what you, why your product is great and what problems it solves. You got to talk to marketing, um, support. Uh, so, and, and, and little detailed things like making sure the transaction works in the, in the deal desk, you know? So it's, it's a, a job that's just hyper-connected across an entire business. So if your business is in building products, you're kind of at the center. Um, but that it gives you really good visibility into you know, what the customer need is, what the markets are like, what sales teams are doing. Um, but a lot of times people think about product management as, as owning the roadmap and a backlog of items, which, which is definitely part of it. Yeah, you know, it's funny, you mentioned, you know, the, the analyst side of things. And something that's, that I've always found interesting is, thing, our, our, I guess our, our processes where companies like Gartner, right, they release the magic quadrant and they're evaluating different products in the space and they're kind of coming up with rankings and so forth. And, and like it or not, that's that's a really big impact, right, on products and where they're received in the market. Um, what's it like to go through the Gartner magic quadrant process or the things that you can kind of share to kind of help help us understand how that works? Yeah, yeah. So you should know it's grueling. <laughs> Because you're never just dealing with Gartner. There's Gartner, there's Forrester, there's Cuppinger, Cole. So there's lots of them. And they do truly impact your business. Um, so the specific, there's a specific process that you go through where they gather information about your product at a specific point in time. So it, it's usually a, just a giant spreadsheet. Um, it's the biggest spreadsheet you've ever seen in your life. And they want to know every detail about your product. They want to see demos. Um they want to see all the documentation. So really they're trying to understand, can your product do what you're saying it can do? And does it meet certain criteria and how does it stack against other vendors in this space? And then there's a cycle of, um, you know, fact checking. So you have a chance to look at what they've come up with and how they've evaluated you. And if there's any errors, you know, you can work with them on that. So that's like the, the technical process. And then you'll get a view of, how you're positioned in advance of it going public. So you have some time to prep your field and um, prepare, you know, if you want to do a press release, so you get a little bit of time. Um, but it's, it's, it's so much work. It's all hands on deck when it happened and the entire company participates because it's not just about your product. It's about your business. It's about your pricing. It's about your strategy. Um, and then, but that's just like one piece. The other thing they look at is, they talk to customers all year long, different kinds of enterprises using different identity products, and they learn what customers like, what they don't like. Um, and then the other thing is it, it's really a year round process where you have relationships with these different analysts and you keep them, you sort of keep them in the loop and how, what you're doing, um, what's happening, because it's hard, you know, it's hard at this time of, of for example, the magic quadrant, to give them every 
every sort of impression in that one spreadsheet. So it really is just an ongoing um, relationship, but also, and in that ongoing relationship throughout the years, you're learning from them. They have a really unique perspective of the world. And so they do influence how you think about the market and feature sets. So it's important. They're like important stakeholders and thinking about the design of your product, but it is the, it's a really hard uh, part of product management and no one escapes it. <laughs> this is part of life. I can imagine. I, I guess I, I always imagine there must be a lot of anxiety on your end. In other words, there's a sub, probably, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but there's probably a submission deadline. You get everything in and oh, then yeah. you, you wait for the, you know, all right, are we going to be ranked as the leader in the magic quadrant, right? That's, and then <laughs> yeah. you wait until it's like, the, the file comes in or the, you know, the quadrant is published or maybe get a preview and yeah. it's like, yeah, I would imagine there's some sleepless nights. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, Fordrug as well um, is a great product. I have managed products that are in decline. And if you're, you know, if you're falling out of it, everybody's panicking, your customers are panicking, they're wondering what's going on. It's a very, you know, it's a very visible piece of collateral that gets out into the world. So um, yeah, definitely a lot of energy to have your product represented um, well, as well as can be uh, in whatever domain that you're in. And super painful, like I said, if you're in a product that's in decline to manage everybody's perception if these analysts think you're declining. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm sure that the the job is very much helped out if you have a, a product that's um, moving up in the world. Yes. So <laughs> yes, um, if, you have, but, if you have a great product with really happy customers, you're so you're you're kind of you know you have a much better shot. <laughs> right. Now I think um, 2020 is a year that we're all going to want to forget at some level. <laughs> and at the same time, we'll never forget it. Um, things that are changing in the world, I'm sure, are having an impact on your role, uh, but specifically around changes that are coming from the pandemic. Everybody working from home. Um, you guys have a lot of enterprise customers. And I'm just wondering how, with what's going on with COVID, how that's impacting your role? How are you, what are you seeing taking place and how is that impacting decisions you make around where to, you know, in, make your investments and where to maybe pull back? Yeah, great question. This has been such a, such an interesting year. And, you know, we had um, our customer advisory board where our top customers share notes about identity and what they're experiencing. So the ones that happened around in the middle of COVID and now are, it's interesting to see how the world is changing for these large enterprises. Um, so there's a couple things they're reporting and I don't think these are surprising, but the, the magnitude of these is interesting, but the, the massive scale overnight. So the way they've represented it is, you know, I used to prep for massive scale. It's Black Friday or it's the World Cup or it's a Royal Wedding or whatever it is. And I have I have 12 to 18 months to plan for this and be ready. And what happened with COVID is it just overnight, like it was Black Friday overnight and I had to sustain that and I didn't, I wasn't able to prepare. Um, the other thing was that the massive increasing in phishing and fraud. And I think anytime you like digitally transform, the next thing that happens to you is a lot of phishing and fraud um, because now you're available online. And so, so many more, there was so many more experiences of that. And so in identity, zero trust sort of thinking and patterns were on the roadmap for 12 to 18 months out to deal with fraud. Um, and those roadmaps just got slashed. So our board reported back, look, like all the red tape is cut. We got to make this happen immediately. So the investment in identity didn't go down. It went up like investment was uh, in identity was certainly protected. Um, and we got some stats from like a bank that said we, we had a 300 increase in our online traffic and a 51% decrease in our local foot traffic, just like overnight. Um, and then we just saw interesting new program scaling, like government programs scaling for contact track and trace education, flipping to digital overnight, which for a lot of schools and education systems was a complete nightmare. They were not prepped, you know, they're not a, a bank. So they're, they're just not that heavy in technology. 
Um, so yeah, those were the the big trends. And I I can talk about what that means to that product, but I'm curious if you've you guys have seen any different trends than that uh, from your conversations. Yeah, we've definitely seen an acceleration, you know, for identity projects. Uh, you know, from an advisory perspective, I thought for sure that we would be starting to slow down a little bit, but I can tell you, we've never been busier, <laughs> you know, yeah, with, same here. Um, all the different work that's, you know, that's going on and people trying to get their handles around, you know, especially the remote access, which I think was a focus kind of earlier on and, you know, uh, areas that were shutting down, doing less travel and, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and now I think it's focused to, from that tactical, how do we get, you know, our remote workers in securely to more strategic thinking around, okay, we really don't want to be in this position again. So how do we start to come up with plans to kind of address some of the core use cases um, with this kind of new normal that we're in? So it's definitely been, you know, impactful, I think for, for everybody, but yeah, it, a lot of people had to pull that bandaid off pretty quickly back in, in March uh, when, you know, things started to, to uh, change pretty drastically. I'm curious if you saw, um, red tape layers kind of being removed as part of this process because a lot of times big enterprises have long procurement cycles, long budgeting cycles, right? Legal reviews, kind of all this stuff that goes along with, you know, hey, we know we need to do something, but it takes six months to do it because of all this different red tape that typically gets in the way of it. Did you see kind of shorter cycles around that or was it pretty much business as usual? Yeah, no, we saw, yeah, we saw heightened urgency and our customers, you know, on, on the large enterprise side. So their slash their their red tape is getting slashed, which means yeah, the buying cycles are shorter, deployment cycles shorter. They're getting, you know, all the focus and energy they need. In fact, in one case, you know, the one of our customers reported like the red tape was slashed too much. People were taking advantage of it and he didn't feel comfortable um, like that. It wasn't, you know, like it wasn't quite uh, appropriate, but yeah, we're seeing um, yeah, we're seeing the budgets protected deals, really critical deals moving fast, moving forward, even in some industries you wouldn't expect like travel, you would think they would be shutting down, but if they need an important identity use case enabled, they can't afford to slow that down. They, you know, so uh, it's been interesting to see really across the board, everybody pushing the pedal down for identity, which, you know, when we, how that impacts how I think about our product decisions, what's interesting to me about all of this is it's, it's the path everybody was on for identity. It's just now they want to get there faster. So everyone wanted to create uh, better digital experiences, have zero trust. It's now they want them faster. <laughs> and they also are dealing with scale that they didn't think was going to happen quite this fast. So, you know, we've, we've always, always factored this in. So in some cases, it's just, we keep doing what we're doing, but doing it faster. But for me, it's, you know, scale, we can never let up on scale and elasticity. The customers that could burst in the cloud during this time were in great shape. Those on-prem struggled. So whether it's cloud, like a SaaS service or cloud, I'm DevOps in a cloud, or if it's gotta be cloud to deal with a, a scale, massive scale increase you never thought of. Um, and then the other part is just having a product that can handle change. So the thing about identity is, some parts of it never change, right? Like I need an identity and you need to control access to things, but what's considered a good experience changes year to year. What's considered strong authentication changes year to year. So you have to have a way to easily and elegantly consume new features, new components. So that means you need to be, you know, if you're not in an, a SaaS service, you need really easy upgrades. And then you also need the ability to swap out different components for experience flows because you, you can't be complacent. What was best of class two years ago is different than it is today. You know, that's really important. I think what you brought up around the bar continually moving is something that sometimes gets kind of lost. You know, a lot of organizations are like, okay, you know, we want to be at a three out of five or a, you know, a, a nine out of 10, right? And whatever, you know, rating system you're using. And it's something that organizations need to consider is that the bar continually moves, right? What is considered strong authentication uh, today might not be tomorrow. And a good example of that is SMS as an MFA component, right? It used to be kind of like, yeah, that's that's good strength, but then with things like yeah. SMS hijacking and kind of all the 
all the security concerns around it, you know, it's even fallen off of NIST uh, recommendations, for example. So, um, you know, what, what is good today may not necessarily be good tomorrow. And that's something that's difficult sometimes for IAM programs and associated products to keep up with. Uh, but that's why you have IAM programs is right, is to make sure that you're continually meeting the needs of the organization from multiple dimensions, security, audit, usability, you know, all the stuff that kind of goes into that. Yeah. I think that Mary, you you also made um, a great point about COVID hit so suddenly you didn't have the time to plan for a year in advance. And so I, you know, just slapping a bunch of band-aids on a product is not strategic, right? That's not what someone in your role would do. Um, so when I think about some of the major foundational shifts and what I'm seeing is people are starting to realize the importance of zero trust now with a remote workforce and so many more people working remotely, zero trust is the game. That means, you know, password lists. It's, it's really highlighting what we've been saying in this industry for so long, which is password alone is not a sufficient enough control. Uh, now, I think you guys have been driving that for a long time, but now customers are really looking for solutions to solve this problem. Um, the other interesting angle, which I think, again, you, kind of your company is really focused on for a long time. And we had Eve Mailer on the podcast a few months ago, the chief humanitarian is the focus on privacy. So you brought up the whole contact tracing piece. Um, and what got me thinking with that is that, you know, again, it's, it's about privacy. I, I think that there's a lot of um, benefit to contact tracing, but I also have a lot of privacy concerns. Yep. I already feel like we've lost so much control over our privacy. And so I think what, you know, and I want to bounce this off of you, but what comes to me is that, all right, these are areas, hopefully you've already been focusing on, and I know Ford Rock has, but these are areas that, you know, are being proven out by the global pandemic that are even more important to continue to double down in those areas and and really build out those capabilities. Yeah, I com I completely agree. I think privacy is a foundational critical component of identity. So the more, you know, I think about it just personally, the more I put myself out there in the digital world, so I'm accessing healthcare records and bank records and children's records from their schools, um, that needs to come paired with a sense of safety and control that that's my data, that you're being careful about it, that I can delete it if needed, that I can share it appropriately with like my husband if I need to, or take that away if I need to. There's a lot of, a lot of privacy concerns. So we, you know, when I think about identity, I think of, it's like, like there's this waterline of, you know, above the surface, my experience logging in, I don't want it to be irritating. I want it to be just easy to log in. But below the surface, I want all that security, all that privacy, privacy, all the zero trust, all of the context and telemetry to ensure that I am who I am and that you're protecting my data and caring about me and thinking about how my information is going to be shared. So I think it's super critical to get that right. And your identity product platform has to support that. It just has to. I'm sure you've come across some interesting use cases uh, from a product design perspective. Um, what are, what's something that you're working on or something you've worked on in the past that was a little bit unique, right? Not kind of your standard run of the mill, you know, authentication or authorization or some other type of, you know, flow that you've had to design against? Well, I'm glad you asked. I have my single all-time favorite use case because it's just so adorable, but we were working with um, an education services company for a particular country. And so they're trying to figure out how to get all the classrooms to be able to log in. So we have to care about children's privacy too, right? They need to be able to log in. And we also have to get them comfortable with technology. And when we were thinking through the use case, it's like, remember, I have all these different classes, all these different teachers. I also have a lot of different demographic of children, including uh, up through pre-K. So we're talking potentially three to five-year-olds. Uh, we can't assume anybody can type their name or password. So it's got to be passwordless. And they can't, they're not going to have a phone. They're not going to have a key fob. They can't scan a QR code. So 
the problem we experience in these classes is the teachers waste so much time getting all these kids logged in or getting their passwords reset. They can't enjoy the time. And they actually calculated out how many minutes per class and how many classes per school and how many schools. And, and actually the, the impact was huge to the education system to really get that login experience streamlined across this broad demographic. Um, and so uh, it, it was fun to think about how we could design um, that end user experience. And so the, the thing that worked the best for especially the younger children, so think about we uh, like a, even a three-year-old. So the way you end up logging in is it's a, it's a story. So the, the kid, the child gets to choose an avatar. So I want to be Batman. So every time I go to log in, there's a Batman and it's got my name on it. So I just click on Batman and then Batman has a story and the story has, um, you know, a few parts to it. So where is Batman going? Uh, he's going to a castle. What's he going to do at the castle? He's going to play basketball. Who's he going to do that with? He's going to do it with Goofy. And so every time they go to log on, they'll select Batman and then just follow the story. I'm going to a castle to play basketball with Goofy. Um, behind the scenes, what it is, is each of those icons and graphics is aligned to a number. So it's essentially a pin <laughs> so they've locked in with their username that was bound to this graphic. And then they're selecting their pin as the story and they get logged in. And we did these, um, you know, we did the UX with children and a three-year-old can do this. You, the, the teacher has to get the initial login set up. So they have to work with them to find the avatar and pick the story. But once that's set up, um, then the kid is really capable of handling this. And I loved it because, you know, getting children happy and comfortable with technology and having that user experience so dialed into what makes sense to them, but also behind the scenes is strong enough identity to care, care for their privacy and their security. I, it just totally warmed my heart also to see the videos of these little kids able to do this. So that's by far my favorite. And in fact, um, I often think, boy, wouldn't I like to log in <laughs> that way <laughs> instead of the long passwords that I have. That is such a cool application of like user experience and kind of technology being transparent right behind it. Um, you know, Batman going to a castle with Goofy to play basketball is such a great story in its own. I'd like to hear more about that story, actually. <laughs> uh, I could certainly see, you know, even for that type of approach, right? Um, maybe some other populations, maybe, you know, it's midnight and you've been out somewhere consuming beverages that have um, reduced your ability to uh, have full cognitive control, let's say, Right. And maybe that might be a way to protect the late night Amazon purchases that you may regret <laughs> later. <laughs> right? um, it's funny you mentioned the the child privacy um, in the U.S. At least there is a, a regulation called COPPA, which stands for Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Um, and it really it's, it really is about prevent, you know, pr uh, protecting children's privacy online and different services they use. Um, how much of a factor does that play when it comes into designing like a process around that? Is there something that you have to consider that that maybe doesn't jump immediately to mind? You know, so, yeah, I think um, we hadn't designed this wasn't in the U.S., so we hadn't designed to that. But, yeah, when you what's interesting about designing these use cases is what I explained was the half of like how we get the the children to actually be able to log in. But the other half is this needs to be a real identity platform that meets all of the local regulation um, and the education, their own security policy for privacy. And so that's the other half of the equation. Um, so I don't have specifics about the, the US regulation, but yeah, so this, you, there's both sides always, um, but that's why you need a full capable, you know, identity platform. And so, you know, with Fordrack, of course, we're doing um, government and financial and healthcare. So we have all of those capabilities. So what we're doing with education is just stacking on um, additional ease of use and in adorable ways that you don't typically see in healthcare or financial. Mm -hmm. So Mary, I'm going to bring up a less adorable use case, which is, but, <laughs> but uh, at least as important, at least in in our world, um, 
you touched a little bit on, you know, cloud deployment and kind of customers who maybe weren't in the cloud. And so for some organizations, it's going to be a strategic decision around leveraging their own private cloud, at least, right? And one thing is making sure that when you have that deployment option available, is that it doesn't fall so far from the cloud that it becomes a, a, a huge burden. And so where I'm going with this is that I've seen you guys make, you know, and, and kind of be leaders around using DevOps tools. And it started with kind of Docker and has continued to evolve. But just that DevOps use case of making um, a the, the solution something that you can um, deploy quickly, you know, expand your infrastructure to meet scale, which obviously is very important. Um, yeah. And be able to, you know, refresh and, and kind of achieve a lot of the benefits of, of, of adopting a SaaS service. But, you know, I, what I always think of with an on-prem deployment is that you have more extensibility. So um, using DevOps has got to be front and center on, in terms of, of your strategy from a product perspective. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And I, um, I, kind, I think about the, the or, overarching issue um, or, or market statement about what's happening with identity is, so if you think about a large enterprise, identity is pretty much the most critical application because every other critical application needs identity. And so there's so much focus and around getting identity right. Is it scalable? Is it available? Does it meet all of our regulation? It's such a critical piece of software in an enterprise. And, um, and there's so much control around exactly how I want it to work and behave. And uh, if you go, so, but everyone also wants cloud, right? Elastic, great. But sometimes you're not willing to give up the control to go to a SaaS service because a SaaS service locks you into a particular feature set. They might have it nicely extensible, but maybe not the level that you wanted, or they might have really good regulation coverage, but not everything you needed, or they might have good SLAs, but maybe not as far as you need it. So the level of control you can have running it yourself is the maximum amount of control you can have, which for some large enterprises, particularly for identity, they want that level of control. And so the only way to get there is through, um, you know, having it totally dialed in with DevOps. So to totally dial it in with DevOps, the product also has to be um, <laughs> available to that. It. it has to have config as code, follow the 12 factor, be fully elastic. So everything has to work really nicely in the private clouds and all of the public clouds. So yeah, it's, and, and then the, the benefit of that is you get the benefit of being able to consume upgrades, super easy, potentially, you know, zero downtime. So you're never getting behind. Um, and also you can elastically burst and scale. So if you have that Black Friday moment unexpectedly, it's not an issue. You just, it's, you can scale up overnight. So it really is, if you, if you're an enterprise that needs that level of control, DevOps is definitely the path. So we've done work at the product level and then also containerization and then all of the automation and the CICD pipeline and all of the testing and all of the different clouds, because it's, um, it's just a whole, um, you can't tackle it by just throwing software in a container. It's just this end to end stack that has to be just completely dialed in. But what's I find interesting about DevOps is like DevOps is all enterprises know they want to get there, but it's hard. Like DevOps is hard and it changes even faster than identity. And DevOps is evolving so quickly. And so it's, um, you know, if like, if you're listening and you haven't started this journey, DevOps is like a, it's a big undertaking in and of itself, I would say. That's the thing that I think some people don't realize is to really get your CICD pipeline dialed in and all of your apps automated. It's not that the identity product is hard. It's just like your whole DevOps program is, is a really big undertaking. Yeah, you're right. I think that's that's an important point. So it is like a program. It is a program, right? It has to be done in a secure way. You have to have the checks and balances in place. That's on top of all this technology that is changing the game for folks like myself who kind of came up where you had physical servers and you go to a rack and you could log into them. Everything's changed. In fact, in in some ways, you know, the, the concept of server is not even really uh, as relevant anymore, but 
Um, you know, so what I wanted, to, what I think is coming out to me is that, um, you know, product management, and I, I guess I've always known this, but it's really coming out as, you know, it's not that a product manager is going to be the most technical person in the company, right? It's, it's a technical leadership role, um, but it's also, there's this balance between technology and business. And, and so one of the questions that I wanted to pose to you is, right, you're, you're the person who straddles that line very well. What are, you know, one of the things I think that we can maybe help educate our listeners on is what are some of the tools that you're using to kind of help sharpen the saw to kind of keep yourself um, improving and becoming a, a, a better leader in kind of the role that you perform? Yeah. Yeah. And in some ways, um, in some ways, I naturally get a lot of great things because I get to work with the best customers and engineers to learn from them. But what I do, what I like to do is also step outside of my environment. Um, I like to volunteer for things I'm not particularly qualified or volunteer for things that will expand my network, be fun, get me thinking in different ways, because um, I really want to ensure I'm not in an echo chamber and I'm innovating like in a really well-rounded way. So, uh, you know, a couple of things I've done is uh, I'll, I'll mention two. One was this pitch competition for journalists. So nothing I mentioned today talked about being skilled and talking to journalists. So really it's not, it's, um, it's something I didn't feel skilled in. And so there was this competition where you had to pitch it face to face. So this was before the COVID hit to over a dozen, you know, top journalists and try and pitch your, your product and your company. And it's not something I typically do, but what it did was it sort of forced me to um, go somewhere that I'm uncomfortable. But what came out of it was I really learned each, well, I should say each journalist had to give me feedback on what I did well and what I didn't do well which was kind of painful to just get over and over and over this one on for hours. But, um, but I learned really how they see the world. I also learned how, how is my public speaking? What is coming across well? What is not coming across well? And so I can get much better about understanding a more well-rounded view of how I talk about our product and how people might understand it that aren't in the domain all day, every day. You know, they, they know a bit about of identity and a bit about technology, but they're not like my customers who live and breathe it every day. So that that was one. Um, another one was I did something that you guys do get to do all the time, but I volunteered for a local, there's a local podcast in Colorado for um, security. And I said, look, I'd love to be a guest host for a few times. And I want to focus on product leaders, female leaders, cybersecurity leaders in the region. Um, and what that did was that broke me out of the identity domain and got me to network with people I wouldn't have otherwise and have deep conversations about what they're doing, what they're interested in. And then what was most important to me was after we finished the podcast, we would all, you know, talk um, trade secrets or, you know, we would talk about behind the scenes because each of us are running products. How's it working? What's happening with you? And so I forged um, new ideas and these connections. So I feel like it didn't so much sharpen my saw as much as put more tools in my tool chest, because I still go to these women regularly to ask for advice or understand what they're doing, because I feel like I can get kind of insulated because I'm talking to a similar profile of customers and I talk to my company, you know, and these analysts, but I want to see further and more. So I'm always pushing to see how I can get opportunities to break out of my um, world. So that's what I've been focusing on. That's fantastic, Mary. I think, you know, a couple of takeaways I got from that is that um, being well-rounded, right? So kind of working on all areas of your your professional presence. Also um, doing things that maybe are outside of your comfort zone. I, I had a similar experience where I took a public speaking course and or I was forced to as part of my, as part of my uh, college curriculum. And I thought to myself, I really don't want to do this. I don't like public speaking. I don't like being up there. And the first few speeches were kind of rough. And you get these, you know, this was, uh, should I admit it? It was in the 90s, right? <laughs> and I got um, the, these feedback, uh, uh, what do you call them? Index cards. Can't even remember the name because nobody uses index cards anymore. The index cards were from the people in the class. And one of them said, you said um a lot, you know, U-M. 
And I was like, oh, I didn't like that feedback at first, but then it really got me to think like, okay, well, I, that's something I need to work on. And so I think by the end of that course, I became a much better public speaker, um, not only from what I was learning in the course, but also just getting up there and practicing and getting feedback from uh, other folks who are in the audience. Yeah, no, I love hearing that because I, I I feel people underestimate how important public speaking is and particularly in the product area. If you can't confidently talk about your product in really sort of scary scenarios, so you might be in front of thousands of people at RSA or you might be in front of 10 people, but they're, they're like billionaire board investors. So you have, if you can't confidently and elegantly talk about your product, um, you don't get those opportunities. So you can't rise up in the product too far because at some point you have to be able to do that. So public speaking for, for product, product management is, um, it, it's really important. And um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, when you look at the things that people are most scared of, that's often, often in the top list, right? It's, it's scary and it's vulnerable to have to do it. So the, the more you get practice, the better, better it goes. I find humor works well too. Yes. You can be self-deprecating. <laughs> it, yes. you know, it, at least that's a that's a good defense mechanism, at least from for my perspective, uh, that I fall on quite a bit. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned confidence because I think that comes from knowing your subject, right? It, it, people yeah. aren't necessarily the best orators or communicators, but if you know your subject and you know the content, right, um, it makes it easier, I think, to transition and, and be able to articulate it in ways that, that others can grasp. Um, I like, as an example, Elon Musk, right? I don't think he's a great speaker, right? If you've ever watched a Tesla reveal or if you watched <laughs> Battery Day the other day, he's not a great presenter and a speaker, but he knows his subject matter, right? And he, you know, does enough to get it across and get people excited around the electric space and, you know, things around electric vehicles and, and so forth. So um, I think it starts with confidence and you get better over time through repetition and you know, learning what yeah. works and what doesn't work and, and so forth. I agree. And I think actually, I think there's no like one way to be the best speaker. I think if you know the content and you're confident, but I also love when people have their own personalities. So they aren't trying to be like the robotically perfect speaker, but you see their personality and their enthusiasm, they're doing it their way. I think that works really well. So um, yeah, I remember when I was working on public speaking, initially I was trying to be that, you know, the polished speaker. And then I realized no, what seems to engage people more is if they feel like they're getting to know me and I'm not, I'm not a robotic, you know, <laughs> business salesperson presenting a product. <laughs> yeah. Be yourself, show your personality. I mean, that's yeah. something that, uh, you know, that I think is easy for people and, you know, to kind of start with is, yeah, don't, don't try to be the, the perfect person that you think people want to see. Just be yourself, right? That's going to yeah. help kind of put you more at ease. So it's good points. And, you know, from a, from an identity space too, you know, there's so much to learn and know what I found, especially when it comes to connections, which is something you touched on earlier is, you know, the identity space is very welcoming to people at all levels. Um, you know, whether you're just getting into it or you've been in it for a while, I find, you know, for the most part, you know, people are very happy to kind of share and educate others and kind of talk about best practices and what's worked and what hasn't worked. And, you know, back in the day when we could all used to go to conferences, right, there was a lot of kind of hallway conversations where, you know, a lot of the, those ideas kind of get shared back and forth and local user groups and things like that are also kind of a good way to do that too. So, you know, for yeah. folks who are just getting into the space, you know, don't hesitate to reach out and ask somebody, you know, what, what they think about a certain problem or, you know, a certain situation, because, chances are it's probably been addressed somewhere before. And the more people that you're able to connect with um, as part of, you know, your network when it comes to identity, um, you know, that much stronger, um, you know, everyone else becomes too. So that's, that's, that's another way that I like to look at it too. For sure. Mary, you've been super generous with your time. Totally appreciate it. Um, before we uh, wrap things up here for this episode, is there, is there anything else that you'd like to bring up and, and let our audience know? No, I just, uh, I'm super excited to be here. Yeah. Anybody listening, as far as connecting, feel free to, you know, connect on LinkedIn. I can be one of those connections for you. So thanks Jim and Jeff for having me. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, Mary. Jim, anything from your side? No, I just echo what you said. Uh, Mary was very um, generous with her time and generous with the information that uh, our listeners who are, the again, the I am practitioners can. There's just so much there. And uh, each week when we have fantastic guests like Mary, um, 
hopefully that the podcast continues to bring value and give you things to think about. And we'd love for our listeners to engage with us and talk, tell us what are the topics that are top of mind for you and what kind of uh, topics would you like us to take on with the podcast um, going forward? Yeah, definitely. So from a, for, for this episode, at least, I'll have show notes in there. Um, we'll put a link to, to Mary on uh, LinkedIn, so that way it's easy to connect there. And uh, don't forget to check us out at Ping Identity's uh, Identify 2020 conference coming up. We'll have a link to that for people to register. And, uh, you know, feel free to follow, you know, Jim and I connect with us on LinkedIn. We're always happy to, to talk identity. And uh, you can visit us on the web at identityatthecenter.com. And with that, uh, want to go ahead and uh, close it up for this week and hope everyone stays uh, healthy and we'll talk to you, with you all in the next one. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. For more episodes, visit identityatthecenter.com.